Hi, my name is Richard. My name is Daisy. My name is Joe. And I'm Hugh, and we're group 14. We're going to be presenting on the tulip breaking virus. So you can go ahead. Uh, we're going to now look at the background, so we're going to introduce some general information in history. So the tulip breaking virus is part of the Coidiviridae family and the Coidivirus genus, uh, and it infects the little yesterday uh, tulips, which include the Barcelona, Monte Carlo, and Yokohama tulips, as well as certain kinds of lilies as well. And you can sort uh, the strains of TBV into two groups. These are the severe tulip breaking virus, which forms stark roots due to the overpigmentation uh, of anthocyanin, as well as mild tulip breaking virus, which removes the anthocyanin, and so you get exposed to mesenchymal. And so a fun virus fact. Um, you can sort Podiviridae by their species demarcation criteria, uh, and so that just tracks identity. And so for Podiviridae, it's 76% nucleotide identity and 82% amino acid identity. And that's actually really low because when we compare our own nucleotide identity, we're 93% similar to racist monkeys and 85% similar to mice, uh, and we don't consider ourselves in the same species. So, uh, so yeah, um, anamorphs. And a little bit of history about TBV. It's actually the second oldest plant virus on record, uh, with the earliest known observations of breaking or the color effect that it causes being in 1576 by a Flemish professor of botany named Carolus Clausius. Um, initially, this discoloration was thought to be like very beautiful. Um, however, as you'll soon learn, the deterioration that the disease ca ca causes in the flowers um, it became a concern. Um, of course, you know, the was not known that this disease was caused by a virus or that it was a disease um, until about the mid-1920s when Dorothy Cayley officially discovered the presence of the virus, um, the actual particles, while researching it at the uh, John and S. Horticultural Institution in South London. So the symptoms of TBV, it all causes coloration of the flower's petals, and so that's due to pigment reallocation of the production of removal. You get different kinds of variants of that. And then it also causes modeling, striking, and disfiguration. And this is the harmful effect since um, this can lead to deterioration of the flower and it, it can ruin entire whole crops of tulip flowers. And so this actually causes the virus flowers to um, wilter away and some of them can become extinct. And examples of these include the viceroy and the sunfer which are only depicted in pictures now. And so there are three main ways that we can detect TBV. The first, uh, people just walk around and visually assess for the different discolorations and track TBV there. You can also run an ELISA, which will basically have an antibody that recognizes the TBV antigen, and so it can bind onto that uh, and tell you how much of a virus is there, as well as new optical sensing protocols that use immunofluorescent um, imaging and multiple cameras to kind of automate and detect pigment pigmentation changes. And so now we can actually get into how the virus TBV actually spreads and infects. Usually when we think about infection and spreading, we think about coughing or sneezing. But with TBV, we actually have uh, vectors, and these include aphids, mites, and white flies. Uh, the main uh, vectors for TBV is, are actually aphids. When the aphid punctures with its silet, uh, an infected plant, it actually drains up TBV through the silet, and the TBV attaches through aphid receptors in the silet, thanks to its coproteins. And these coproteins connect with the receptors, thanks to HC protease, which we will get to later. Um, now we're going to actually go through the molecular mechanisms, which is the structure, the proteins, and just the general build of its biology. So the general structure is that it is a single-stranded positive RNA molecule. It's encased in 2,000 units of coprotein, and there's a single molecule within the coproteins. It's not enveloped, and it's really rod-shaped and fluid. It's actually able to replicate, replicate inside the cell's cytoplasm, and it's actually the Podiovirus is actually identified through the pinwheel-shaped inclusions, also called cylindrical inclusions. So on the image above, we're actually able to see the podiovirus virion is coated in a lot of proteins, and these proteins, like we said, attach to receptors inside vectors, um, like the aphid receptors, and that's how it's able to transfer from plant to plant. And on our left, we're able to see uh, the cylindrical inclusions inside of cytoplasm, and this is how we actually identify polyviruses versus other viruses. Um, with the image D, we're actually able to see the artistic rendition of what these pinwheels or cylindrical inclusions would look like up close and personal. And here we just have another um, example of what a virion will look like in the polyvirus family. They just look like long strings. And in this example, we have the plumpox virus, which is also a, another polyvirus. And we actually have 
plenty of proteins encoded in this single-stranded RNA molecule. Um, they're pretty easy to memorize. P1 protease simply cleaves itself with, from HC pro. HC pro protease proteases itself and away from P3. It also helps attach the coproteins and the aphid receptors, which allows transmission between plant and plant. Next, we have the P3 and the 6K1 protein. These are theorized to be essential for cleavage functionality and is able to control the rate of cleavage. Next, we have a protein that includes encodes for the cylindrical inclusions, which enact pro uh, helicase activity and is a protease itself, which helps with RNA replication. Uh, we have 6K2, which anchors NIA and VPG precursors. VPG is actually encoded as well, which is a primer for RNA synthesis and helps RNA replication inside of the cell. Um, NIA protease cleaves a large portion of this polyprotein and allows the proteins to start activating and working together. Um, NI NIV is actually the RNA polymerase, which is very essential for RNA replication, as we learned in our initial weeks in this class. And finally, we have CP, which is just the coprotein, which allows attachment between the virus itself and the receptors, which allows for vector connection and transmission. All right, so now we'll start talking about the life cycle of this virus. So like any other virus, the first step of the potivirus life cycle is to actually enter the host cell. And the potivirus has two ways of doing this. One is from the outside. So these aphids that uh, feed on these plants, they kind of poke around and probe the plant prior to feeding. Uh, that pokes holes in the cell wall, and then the virion can just slip in. And then uh, if we're going from an already infected cell in, the other, in another part of the plant, they can enter via the plasma desmata. And we'll talk more about this when we get to the egress section. After the virion enters the cell, uh, it has to uncoat. So normally, this piece of RNA has a lot of coproteins around it, and this is very helpful for protecting it against degradation. But in order to be translated or replicated, it has to, um, it has to get rid of these proteins. And they're not actually sure how the uncoating mechanism works, but they suspect it has to do with the VPG protein, which is attached on the five prime end. So after it starts uncoating, we can uh, start translating our protein and uh, actually start infecting the cell. So this translation can begin before the genome is fully encoded. Uh, the genome lacks a five prime cap, so this whole thing is translated cap independently via VPG. It produces a single polyprotein, as you see here. Um, and this polyprotein is 3,000 to 3,350 amino acids. And um, we actually have this little pupil protein here that is important, but it's not uh, part of this larger polyprotein. And this is because it's generated through polymerase slippage. So as this, uh, as this polymerase goes down, uh, when it reaches the P3 area, it might stutter a little bit, and then it produces the shorter polyprotein. And then uh, this thing, after cleavage, as mentioned before, when the P1 cleaves itself, HC cleaves, cleaves itself, then this uh, people protein can just kind of float around. And as a result, we see much higher proportions of this protease, lower proportions of this people, and then kind of same proportions across the rest. So when it cleaves it, as mentioned before, uh, these proteases do their work and produces 10 proteins, which are mostly equimolar, except for these proteases in the beginning and this people protein. And uh, that's kind of a problem for this virus because as you recall before, uh, our RNA needs 2,000 coproteins to envelop it. So in order to create 2,000 of these coproteins, it also has to create 2,000 of all these other proteins. So by the peak of our replication, we have a ton of these other proteins just present. And this is what forms the inclusion bodies that we can see through the microscope. And another problem with the coprotein is that while we want a lot of it at the end, we actually don't want it at the beginning because um, the coprotein just kind of naturally binds onto the virus, uh, the viral RNA. And if that happens early on, the, vi the virus isn't going to be able to replicate or translate anything. So the virus recruits some host proteins to phosphorylate this coprotein and uh, and this causes it to be targeted for degradation. So they just kind of get rid of it until later, later stages, then they let it come back and uh, produce, produce a lot of coproteins so that they can envelop their RNA. Now that we're all ready with these proteins, we want to replicate our DNA. So the first thing that happens is a viral replication complex forms. And a crucial part of this is the RDRP, which is the NIV protein. Um, and this RDRP, it uses the VPG as a primer. And uh, you'll recall the VPG is actually on the 5' end, and if you're, um, if you're replicating DNA, you've got to start on the 3' end. 
So how they do this is they actually circularize it. So we have this nice little circle with a little overlap at the bottom. And now the five prime and three prime are together and they can be a primer, uh, replicate, and then linearize again. Um, another virus that uses VPG in a similar way is the polio virus, which uh, I thought was pretty neat because you wouldn't really imagine that a plant disease and a human disease would be so closely related, but there it is, they use the same mechanism. Uh, the negative strand RNA stays inside the VRC. Uh, it's not really needed anywhere else. And then the positive strand RNA just gets exported to the cytoplasm. So now that we have all this positive strand RNA, all these proteins, it's time to leave the cell. Uh, we first want to assemble it. We have our RNA coprotein, uh, VPG. This, these are the most important parts. They put them together and then they got to move out. Uh, the first way is cell to cell. Uh, the coprotein and this protease, in order to let the virion leave the cell, they got to snip some holes in the plasma desmata, open them up so that it's more permeable. Um, and then if they want to move to faraway places of the cell, they can use the vascular system. So the vascular system of a plant, you know, it brings uh, water up, brings sugars down. Uh, it can invade the sieve elements, which are what transport these nutrients. And to do this, they need the coprotein, the protease, and the VPG. And this just gets the virus into the vasculature, and then it just goes everywhere in the plant. And then third way, of course, is the aphid. Um, if the aphid comes and feeds on an infected plant, the virions hitch a ride on their stylet and uh, move on to greener pastures. And of course, the plant doesn't want this to happen. So they have some ways of trying to shut down viruses. But the viruses uh, want to survive, so they also shut down the host defenses. So the first thing the virus does when it enters the cell is that it prevents RNA silencing. So it shuts down these defenses. And then next, it shuts down everything else the host does. So it degrades all the host mRNA. And then this degradation somehow spreads to the entire plant through a signal that's currently unknown. And um, this is why the host plants can't recover. So when we have um, a plant that's infected with tulip breaking virus, even if the virus is completely eradicated, the plant can't survive anymore because it can't make any proteins. And uh, the virus also upregulates polyubiquitin, HSP. This enhances viral replication. And as you'll remember from before, heat shock protein is used in coprotein degradation early on. So this is a pretty important protein for this virus. So yeah, that's the life cycle of our virus. First we enter, then we uncoat, translate, process, replicate, and then we move out. Yeah, now for the impacts, uh, starting with environmental impacts, uh, it's actually very interesting that the uh, the biggest impact itself is not the disease decimating these uh, fields of tulips, uh, but actually trying to combat the disease. So as Stacey had said, um, primarily it spreads through aphids and other little insects as you know they're acting as vectors. Um, and we use some pretty tough insecticides trying to kill all of these bugs, and that's actually caused some huge environmental concerns. So new regulations are limiting how strong uh, the insecticides can be and how much farmers can use. Um, so they're trying to find some new ways to, to fight the virus. Um, but then also agriculturally and economically, um, although the harmful insecticides uh, that are used to stop TBV, TBV um, are very effective, that kind of like allows the farming to happen, um, uh, economically, they're, when they can't use the insecticides, there are huge um, uh, impacts for these flower uh, growers. So if you think about the Netherlands, um, for example, they spend 9 million euros per year paying uh, quote-unquote flower experts to walk through the fields and pick infected flowers. Um, furthermore, when TBV isn't controlled, um, they just face economic hardship. So in 2008, for example, 2.3% uh, of the Netherlands tulip crop was lost to TBV, and that equated to 2.18 billion US dollars in losses. Um, looking quick at the next slide, we have a really fun Van Gogh painting here of bulb fields. And although we can't confirm it, more likely than not, even Van Gogh while traveling through the Netherlands would have come across tulips that would have been infected. Uh, and then on the following slide, we just have a, another couple pictures of what these huge tulip fields look like. And you can just imagine uh, you know, the heyday that a virus might have um, kind of going through all of the, those flowers. Um, but a really cool study uh, is looking into actually developing flower picking robots. And these robots are going to use spectral cameras to actually detect color change and discoloration much uh, quicker than the human eye can. And what these robots will do is they'll see it with their spectral camera with their eyes. And they'll actually roll out into the field and pick those uh, tulip bulbs before the, the virus can spread. Uh, and then for our references, we'll just quick, click through quick so you can pause and read them if you want. Um, but we just want to say thank you to, for every, to everybody for watching. Uh, you know, learning about TBV barely brushed the surface of the complex and extraordinary world of plant viruses. So here you can see two phylogenies of all the different kinds of, of plant viruses. So we hope this was a good sneak peek into that world and that 
some of you might be inspired to learn more about them now. So thank you.